necessarily in a mental ascension. It's like, yes, that's true. Well, what is that? That is my spirit. My soul is bearing witness to this truth more akin to a remembering than a learning. Would you say that's like deja vu or would you say like that these are experiences because of previous life that has been lived already? You're a single life expressed in multiple instances. A spirit, an energetic form that takes on human form in multiple instances to experience multiple different condi conditions and learnings to mm. choose ultimately, in my opinion, love. I'm Luke, and you're listening to the Luke Mind Power Podcast. What's up, everyone? How you doing? Welcome to another episode on the Luke Mind Power Podcast. Uh, get ready for some heavy uh, wisdom, some powerful um, success stories and motivation and inspiration um, from uh, an amazing individual. His name's Sebastian Engers. He's uh, the CEO of Phoenix Consulting Group. He's an entrepreneur, speaker, and I'm sure many other things that we don't know about, but we're going to find out about this, this uh, extraordinary person and uh, you know, I want to welcome Sebastian to the Luke Mind Power podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, Luke. Yeah, man, absolutely. Thank you for your time. I'm sure that it's precious. I'm sure that you've got like major stuff going on all the time. Um, but, um, you know, the, the journey of success is a long one. Uh, it's an ongoing one. Um, give us a bit of a, uh, a bit of just a snippet or an insight, because I'm sure you've got a story. Everyone does um, of, of, you know, what kind of first inspired you or, has motivated you because what I look at on social media, what I see on your content, bro, you're driven. Like you, you, you're, you're hardcore. <laughs> well, I appreciate, I appreciate the, uh, the description. I, I grew up, uh, as we were talking a second ago, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. I was raised by a single mom. My brother and I was the oldest of two. My mom passed away when I was very young and as the oldest son, the, uh, the U S government sent me her, her earnings, uh, her entire uh, time. I was a, a kid her whole life, but, through my childhood. So I was able to see, and she had never, and I wasn't necessarily surprised by this, but it really hit home. We lived at poverty level. Her income was right around poverty level my entire childhood. Now, I, to be fair, I didn't necessarily feel impoverished. And I don't know that we ever went without food, but money was just a big, a big part of every decision that was made in our life. And I didn't have I didn't look around and have a lot of role models of success uh, where I lived. And to me, that was all the more reason to be a success. I think so much of what motivates me is to just be an example of what's possible. I am really, really big. My, my, my core values are, are in order, truth, love, freedom, community, and in that order. And I'm a big advocate for personal responsibility. So generally, people who don't enjoy my message don't enjoy it because they don't enjoy the personal responsibility message. Uh, but that's because our way out of our situation is always through us. Right? It's not low level consciousness is thinking life is happening to me, right? And 85% of the world still lives there. A big study uh, came out last year said 85% of human beings are still unaware. And that makes sense. I was surprised it was, it wasn't more, but they're just living at an unconscious level, right? It's, it's groundhog's day. It's, it's, it's a, a non-conscious way of living. And so, uh, my goal is to, help hopefully those who are ready to awaken hopefully i can i can tip the scales a little bit and help them move in that direction where they start to think differently about their world and start to own who they are and take responsibility for their result mm -hmm. absolutely powerful stuff man thanks for sharing so one of the things that i've experienced myself and i think that many people will go through this if you're listening to this podcast then obviously you're on a journey of growth and development and becoming a better version of yourself how much experiences have you had with like you know you know that you're planting positive seeds you know that you're sharing the information that is so valuable and rich and powerful but you have maybe resistance from like family members or friends or people that you know that you know they could benefit so much from the information that you have um have you had to deal with experiences like that well i, I mean of course it's showing up and having a human experience that is an undoubted uh, a part of that i had two early operating assumptions when i dropped in that I, sh I used until probably 21, 22, which was everybody wants truth and everybody wants to grow. And this screwed me up when I was younger because I, I operated from that place in all of my interactions with people, right? We, we were seeking truth together. Right? We want truth and we want to grow. And it caused a lot of uh, frustration and confusion for me because I, 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 I didn't, 
look under the hood of that assumption, I just, I thought, of course, everybody wants to grow. Of course, everybody wants truth. And it was only when I was able to step back and go, okay, wait a minute, that's, that's actually not true. That's a, that's a poor assumption to make that our number one value is truth or we're, that we are inherently seeking truth as human beings or that we all want to grow. And so uh, the reason I bring it up and the frame of the question is because once I was able to get my head around, well, truth isn't always a priority to everyone. Truth could be incredibly inconvenient and truth, if truth wrecks your identity or story of self, most people will, will surrender the truth to enforce their identity. And you see this all over the world um, and, and conflict all over the world very often is tied to this. When you see contention around people groups, it's this story of identity that may or may not have anything to do with truth. Uh, and then growth, right? It's like, well, everybody wants to grow. So once I realized those two things weren't true, it was very easy for me to show up, change how I show up around people and unconditionally love them without feeling the necessity to try to change them, right? And so I, I don't, I'm compelled to impact the world, but I will not force change on anyone. And I won't, I won't generally force information on someone who isn't asking. And so social media has been a bit of a revelation for me. I've only been doing it the last few years, but it's true. It's like when you, when you speak authentically and you speak your truth, your tribe will find you, people who resonate with that message. And I think about, I've studied many of the avatars that have come um, and it preached truth to humans for the last couple of millennia. But Jesus comes to mind in this and that he spoke to the Jewish people that should have known better. Right. They were the ones he's like, they're the ones that 400 years of silence. He shows up and he starts speaking their Bible back to them or their Torah back to them, the Old Testament. And they couldn't see him. They couldn't see the, as I said, the forest through the trees because they were so wrapped up in their religion that they could not understand what he was saying. And ultimately we know they killed him for it. But when he would speak to the masses, he would say, let those who have ears hear. What he was saying is let those who are at the level of consciousness to understand what I'm saying, understand everyone else, you're good. I like he didn't try to force truth on people whose minds and ears were not open to hearing it. And so mm -hmm. Uh, I learned a long time ago to surrender that. I'm not saying it's always easy, but I, I'm not about trying to force change on somebody who isn't ready to hear it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. I, I think, you know, when I first started this journey as well, you know, I, it took me a little bit of time to just to just realize that, you know what, my job is not to change people. My job is to just be myself. Yes, you know? exactly. And just show up and the right people will gravitate. And, you know, as I always say, you'll never lose the wrong people. Yeah. And, and personal, like, the personal responsibility journey, kind of sticking with that theme is if we want to change the world, it starts with changing ourselves. If we want to raise consciousness, the person that we need to focus on is raising our consciousness because that has an amplifying effect throughout humanity. And so there's a, there's an energy in our world right now that is so distracted by pointing the finger outward and blaming everyone else when all lasting change is going to happen by doing the work yourself. And that mm -hmm. message of personal responsibility is not, a, a, in some circles, is not a very fond one. Mm -hmm. When you say doing the work, what are you specifically referring to? Uh, waking up, doing the work of identifying our traumas, our stories, our mistruths, uh, our coping strategies, our habituated patterns of behavior that are not serving us, uh, becoming more conscious of the decisions that we're making starting to really understand our values, becoming more aware. I, my, my book will be out this year and, and it's really a story of identity and it's really on identity, but it's the, the focus is awareness. Everything starts with awareness, right? And it, I mentioned earlier, but 85% of the population is unaware. And I think the hilarity of that is the stat, I think it's 95 or 96% of human beings think they're aware, right? Which just only amplifies this point. Uh, and so I would define awareness as anywhere in your life, or if you're trying to, to work through this, anywhere in your life where you continue to get an unintended consequence, positive or negative, but normally we identify the negative ones easier, uh, that you continue to get a negative consequence, you are unaware. So you're the fly hitting the window, expecting it just to open. And in my own coaching practice and in my businesses, I see this all the time. It's like people are confused why they're not getting a result of their life. And you can tell where they're at consciously, because if they're totally unaware, they speak as if life is happening to them, right? I'm mm -hmm. at the effects of life. I'm at the circumstances of life. They, they don't have a way to solve for themselves. So everything is outside of themselves. When you become more aware 
that narrative begins to change. That story begins to change. And you start looking at the outward world. You start looking at your inner world. What world am I creating? And we're all having a highly subjective experience on earth by design. This world was meant to be a sandbox of subjectivity where we get to experience the world through our lens and learn our lessons. This is really important because a lot of us would like to believe that we're seeing a very objective um, reflection of the world. But in fact, we see the world the way we are, not the way it is. Yeah, it's true. And, uh, and that's really the power of everybody's mind, um, you know, making up the stories given, uh, you know, your own experiences, perceptions, information, stuff that, that you've, you know, you're, you're, you've been conditioned with. And you you mentioned one thing on your Instagram page, uh, I was watching one of your videos, and you're talking about the news, one of the things uh, that, you know, blocks us from like, the next level is just a limited way of thinking. And, and, you know, that comes down to also fear, doubt, um, within yourself, you know, um, the, one of the best things I did when I first started this work was I switched off the TV, oh, yeah. um, which was six years ago, you know, um, and man, like I, it was that moment there where I was becoming aware, like I would come back to my sister's place and it was the same thing. It was like cook dinner, put the news on <laughs> and not realizing what is actually happening. Yeah. You know, and most households, right. I get it. Some people are trading on Forex or in oil or gold or whatever it is. And they want to see what's going on around the world and all that kind of stuff. Some people have big companies and, and what, hap what happens in the news also affects business and all that kind of shit. I get it. Um, but the awareness of what's actually being presented and shared every day, you know, like it's 97% or whatever it is, uh, negative. Yeah. Of everything that's going wrong. But I mean, no wonder like everyone's living in fear and everyone's fucking scared. Like, yep. you know, how do you think that you're going to like achieve that next level or reach your potential or become a better version of yourself? Or, you know, if you're, if you're constantly, you know, consuming and fueling yourself with this negative information, it's, it's such a low vibrational frequency that it zaps your energy because it's like you, what you get, what you focus on. Most Christians don't know this, but the number one commandment in the Bible by times mentioned is do not fear. And there's a reason for it, because fear is the opposite of love and its energy is the opposite of creation. Right? And so that that energy staying in that energy will keep you oppressed. Mm. Uh, and so that's an important thing to understand and to move away from things that feed on fear. And the news is, is one of those things that wasn't always that way, but it certainly is that way now. Um, it, it, it's a chemical concoction that is highly addictive that feeds on fear. And part of that is the, the biology of human, the brain of human is predicated on survival and it, to be fearful is design wise is a, is a far more effective way to ensure the, the species exists longer than pleasure, right? So I get it from a design element, but to become conscious and to start thriving, you have to choose to turn off that filter and start looking at the world through a different lens. Mm, absolutely. What's your take on self-love? Because for me, I mean, for you as a, as a, you know, grown adult man, fucking successful, you know, you're doing your thing. Uh, how, and, and has that been something that you've developed within yourself? Because let me, you know, just from where I came from, I never had anything like that. I never even knew it existed a relationship with myself, you know, my own appreciation for who I am. Um, I think the one thing that I've learned over the last few years of doing coaching and working with so many people, a lot of the majority being women. And I'm just like, man, I like only this year I started working with a lot of men, but we have this block as men is we yeah. have this, this, this ego, this like, you know, nah, you know, oh, don't worry about talking about it or just leave it. You know, we're suppressing so much, you know, did you have an experience that you kind of went through where you were just like, damn, this vulnerability came in, opened your heart up. I was the oldest son of, of uh, two, raised by a single mother. As a result, I took on the role of, of husband and father in many ways at a very young age, which sounds maybe weird, but not in any weird way. Just I was the oldest son, so those responsibilities fell on me one way or the other. And so there was a lot of early pressure. I don't know that somebody else put it on me. I would just say I put it on myself to perform and to come through for others. Uh, and so I did have to go through that work in my, my early late teens, early twenties of acknowledging, I don't have to be perfect. 
right? Mm-hmm. Because somewhere along the way, I began to believe that. I didn't, I didn't always believe that. I think in an effort to try to connect with human at a very early age, which was challenging for a lot of reasons, I started to pick up human tendencies or human behaviors, and I started to believe these things about myself. And somewhere along the way, I started to realize I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to do everything perfect. Uh, and so I began to strip away a lot of these, these stories that did not serve me and really began to focus on loving and acknowledging self in a, in a healthy way. Uh, and I don't know that I ever, I don't know that I ever struggled with loving myself, but I wasn't always good at taking care of myself, treating myself well, right? My, my physical body, my emotional body, because I felt like I needed to be strong for everyone else. And I do think uh, and, I, and I coach a lot of men and women, and I think that is, I think men and women deal with self-love issues, but for different reasons or, or in different, it's expressed in different ways. And the masculine generally tends to shove it down. I don't want to pay attention to it. I don't want to look around. I'm just supposed to be tough and take it. And it's very hard to love other if you have not first learned how to love yourself. And if you haven't learned to love yourself and you are seeking love from other you need them. And that becomes a problem because I don't know how you could functionally love someone you need. Mm. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to get their head around or even begin to understand. Like sometimes I have this conversation with like, what would be the point of being in a relationship with someone I don't need? That's how that's the frame that so much of human shows up to. It's like, what do you mean? Why would I even be in a relationship with somebody I don't need? Well, how different if you need someone how could you unconditionally love them? Mm. Right? Like your, your, your need will drive the behavior, not love. And you mm-hmm. see this because what happens in most relationships, high levels of control, mm-hmm. the person becomes a means to serve your end to whatever it is that your psychological needs you're trying to get met by them. And in, in, in an effort to ensure that you continue to get that, you will control that person through whatever level of uh, emotional or or verbal or sometimes physical control to make sure that you continue to get that need met. And you see people do this in relationship all the time. And then the relationship fizzles out, which is, you know, in the Western world, um, where I think we're over 50%, at least in the United States, we're over 50% of marriages in a divorce. And we're totally rethinking marriage. The institution of marriage is, is being totally retooled right now. And I think we'll eventually come back to something that will be healthy but more and more people are, are choosing not to get married uh, and we're changing relational structures in a wild way. And I think ultimately it's a good thing because I think it's going to help us kind of recalibrate a lot of these things and our orientation and relationship to other. But uh, I don't think it's possible to functionally love someone else unconditionally unless we first learned to love ourselves. Now, some people will say, I only learned to love myself because someone else loved me first. Fair. I, I don't have an issue with that. And I, I do think people have what I would describe as angels show up in their life and show them the way. Sure. To me, that still doesn't uh, take away from the fact that we have to take personal responsibility for ourselves and solve for ourselves first. And so learning to love yourself exactly where you are, love yourself for who you are, accept yourself for who you are. All real changes is only possible on the other side of accepting who we are, because if, if we're wasting energy and time trying to defend self, or deny self and live from our ideal self, as I call it, then we're not doing the work, right? We're, we're, we're spending all of our energy trying to project we're something we're not, or trying to, to, um, feign that we are something we're not. When in fact, if we just take a very real approach and acknowledge, Hey, this is who I am. This is how I show up in this world right now. Right. And acknowledge and accept that now the real work can begin. And there's I outlined there's really seven steps, seven steps to mastery. And I've really tried to trim this down because that just seems like so much, but I, it, it really is a process. Um, it, it starts with self-awareness, right? We become aware of who we are. That awareness invites exploration. Exploration leads to discovery. Discovery leads to understanding. Understanding leads to acceptance. Acceptance leads to, to transcendence or to move through this and into mastery of self, which by my estimation, is really the work of being human, right? It's the the game, if you will, the gamification of this plane or this realm is the challenge of dropping in as a powerful entity, a spiritual body into a human form and learning how to, if you will, conquer or surrender into spiritual principles in human form. How do you do that? And it's a very challenging place to do it. 
not unlike a really challenging video game. Sebastian, I think you're like, uh, you're, you've just taken everyone on like a journey that has <laughs> just like gone, wow, what? <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing, man. Honestly, like I was just, you took me back to basically what I was living through before I started doing this work, because that's what I was, that's how I was needy. And I was, and I was living in that way of, you know, I need a relationship. I need that because otherwise if I don't have that, and that was just the loss uh, of my identity because I didn't have a relationship with myself. So I was always comparing myself to other people and what everybody else was doing. So I was living in lack because my life wasn't working out the same way as theirs. And so then I'm not good enough. And so I'm not going to be good enough unless I have a relationship, unless I have someone in my life that's loving me. So, um, and that was where everything shifted because I was like, you know what? Like I have been rejected. I have attracted people who, you know, I just settled for. Um, and, and I've never spent time with myself. Um, yeah. and that's where everything changed, man, because I was just like, you know what, I'm going to just have a relationship with myself. I'm going to get to know me. I'm going to figure myself out. Like I've, I'm always wanting other people to love me, but then I realized that I didn't actually love me. And that was the, that was the missing link, man. You know, it was like the cocaine or the alcohol or the girls, you know, or being like other people. You know, and this is the yep. big thing of like, you know, you, you talk about authenticity, right? You talk about like accepting yourself, you know, but there's the fear of like, if I start being like this, then I'm going to make other people feel uncomfortable and I might right. be rejected. Right. Yeah. So, so in the fear of being rejected, we don't want to be rejected, bro. We want to be part of the part of the community. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're right. social animals the, the, the built into the hardwiring. You certainly do want to be part of the community. Um, you, you said so many really powerful things, and I really appreciate you sharing your own personal experience. And, and I, I think a lot of people can resonate with that. We spend so much of our life trying to, to fit in. But if we're not living from our authentic self, there's nothing more exhausting than trying to be something you're not. And over time, that wears off. And if all of your validation in your life is coming from an outward circumstance, you are going to be heavily controlled by the other, right? By, by whatever is outside of yourself. Uh, and we, I think there is a, a general proclivity or desire to be in community and to be accepted. Uh, but I think one of the greatest lessons you can learn is to understand, and I mean this with absolute respect to humanity, 99.9% .9 of people are thinking about only themselves. They're not even solving for the other, right? So it's like we take things like somebody, as an example, somebody cuts you off, drive another road, you're in traffic and you get cut off. You will project a personal experience onto that, that they did it personally to you, that they, they, you know, that they were thinking about you or trying to piss you off or trying to stop you from getting, they weren't thinking about you at all. There was no concern for you. And it's, it's how often do we spend time and energy trying to get approval from people who are not spending any time or energy thinking about us at all. They're too busy thinking about themselves. There's an old saying that two egos will never meet. And it's a, a beautiful truth. Two egos will never meet because the only thing an ego can see is itself. Hmm. Right? So why waste time trying to seek the approval of others? Seek the only person that any of us should be trying to get approval from is ourselves. Right? Become, and then that becomes the basis for real community. So if we become codependent, right? We, when we drop into this world, we drop in dependent by design, right? I have a, a two month old at home and I'm thinking, I'm seeing this, this beautiful baby boy and he's completely dependent on us to take care of him. Well, if we don't teach him correctly, if we don't create the right conditions, it's easy to go from dependent to codependent. And a lot of people do this. There's a lot of boys who are raised by women who go into the go into adulthood and now they're looking for a mom, not a partner, not a wife, a mom, because they never learned how to become independent. Right. So they're looking for codependence and they're looking for validation in the other. And and so this becomes a problem. If we're going to become free, right, as and and, and contextual is what we're referring to here, only independent people can then choose to become interdependent. Right? So it's only when you've done the work and you now show up as an independent, autonomous human being, can you choose to then be interdependent in community. If you are in a codependent relationship trying to build community, it's, it's a house of cards. It's not stable and it's going to cause a lot of pain because what is moving that is your wounds, your traumas, your needs. 
Mm-hmm. And so that that's the work for me is only free people can help other people get free. There's a, there's a, to the power, um, to the 10th power amplification of consciousness as more people get free, it helps that elevates consciousness. So all we need to do is continue to help people wake up and begin to solve for themselves, right. And shift from life is happening to me to at the very least life is happening for me. But I think there's really probably five stages of consciousness or leaps in consciousness. Life is happening to me. Life is happening for me. Life is happening by me. Life is happening through me or with me, right? If we can just get to me to for me, that is the kickstart that will get humanity rocking because now we're looking at the, through the lens there. What can I learn through these experiences? What am I here to learn? And I think much of learning is simply remembering. It's simply remembering what we forgot when we dropped in, Mm. which is why very often when we hear truth, when we're ready to hear it, it bears witness here, right? It's not necessarily in a mental ascension. It's like, yes, that's true. Well, what is that? That is a, my spirit, my soul is bearing witness to this truth more akin to a remembering than a learning. Would you say that's like uh, deja vu or would you say like that these are experiences because of a uh, previous life that has been lived already? You're a single life expressed in multiple instances a spirit an energetic form that takes on human form in multiple instances to experience multiple different condi- conditions and learnings to mm. choose ultimately in my opinion love in all cases can i drop into this experience and ultimately choose love can i experience separation and still choose love right but there are experiences so then the layered we would say we would call them multiple lives. And for those who are like, what the hell it, you're, it's still a single life expressed in multiple instances that we would say throughout time. And we know that time is relative, right? Time is, is really more illusory than not. And, you know, Einstein was uh, one of those who made it very clear, but it's expressed in time because that is the only way that space and time is the only way I would say is the way we express those experiences or we get to experience those things only with space and time is that possible so one lifetime or one life expressed in multiple lifetimes incarnate Mm. yes but i would also suggest that when you're not in body you have access to all knowledge it's like being plugged into the oneness so you're when you drop into body you have to provoke remembering these things because of the hindrance and the density of this planet that this realm you don't always remember, does not recall easily. It's part of, as far as I can tell, the gamification or the gaming of this, this plane and, and by design, as far as I can tell. When you're not in body, though, all remembering comes back to you. Where have you learned all this stuff, man? I know that it just doesn't drop out of nowhere. Like, how much, like, have you done a lot of extensive research or, like, who have been your teachers or people that you've inspired you that you've learned so much of this knowledge from? Because it's powerful, man. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I am a, I am a student first and foremost. I'm For always sure. learning. I'm always questioning. I, I think my, my fundamental belief is I'm not interested in teaching people what to think. I'm very interested, including myself, teaching people how to think. Mm. And if we have the tools of how to think, we will come to truth. If you seek truth first. So Many of us are raised in environments where we are taught to look at things from what is right, what is wrong, which is a very dualistic way of looking at the world. And it's a very limiting way of looking at the world, albeit useful at a certain level of consciousness. So it has its place. But if ultimately anyone whose number one desire is to seek truth, truth is seeking you. It wants to be remembered. Mm. So all you like, my goal is simply to create conditions that allow the other to begin to do the work and remember what they have forgotten. Does this make sense? So this, this is just, accessible to said, anyone. Yeah. You just said truth wants to be remembered. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. Like, All we have that to was do like a light bulb. Eh? <laughs> I was like, man, that's powerful shit, you know, because the, tr- the, the truth, the, the, the facts are that we all have it. We all have the hidden truth. Like, what is that for you listening right now? It's because what, like, I mean, it's obviously it's the truth will set you free. You've heard that how many times, but it's like, it is, the, it's, it's sitting there waiting. Yes. All we have to do is choose it. 
And that's, that is the gamification of this planet is to choose truth and mm. to see truth through the illusion, right? Which as far as I can tell, part of the design of the sandbox, which is, and I don't mean to make it trivial, but that's kind of the fun of this, this whole experience. And that is, the, as far as I can tell, the goal of this experiment is to raise consciousness under these conditions. And that's where mm. the game is fun. So I said in the beginning, I said my foundational values is truth, love, freedom, community. For me, truth and love are 1A, 1B. They're two sides of the same coin, right? They're, you can't have one without the other. And so very often, speaking of love very quickly, very often we are trying to create love. We're looking for love. We're seeking for love. When in fact, all we have to do is remove the obstacles we put in the way from experiencing love. Love is our birthright. It's always there. We were never separated from love. Now we can choose to not experience love. We can choose to not be in its presence, but that's on us. It's like, it's like saying the sun doesn't exist because there's clouds or because we're indoors. No, mm -hmm. the sun exists. It always exists. It's always there. Whether we're experiencing it or not is very much up to us. Right? And so love is very much that the other side of the truth coin is all we have to do is remove whatever obstacles we've put in the way from experiencing love's presence. And when you experience love's presence, independent of another human being, now you can freely love and be loved. Mm. Yeah. We're talking before about fear. And I was like, well, when you develop that love within yourself and have that unconditional love, uh, you know, like I always say, you know, love yourself enough to, to, to believe it's possible. Love yourself enough to, to take the action. Love yourself enough. And that's why I always base uh, the healing journey as well. I always say that your healing is a byproduct of self-love. When you love yourself enough, you'll, you'll heal your past because you, you, you can't carry it anymore. And you have to have that connection, that emotional connection of, of love within yourself to go, you know, I love me so much. I'm willing to do this, you know, um, to, to, to heal that, to address it, to, to give light to it, to, to love that dark energy or the dark or that, that pain from the past, which I think is one of the, the challenges for most people is like, we're trying to move forward, but we haven't processed that. We've still, we're still holding on to so much from the past. What are some tips, uh, or some strategies or something that you can share, um, you know, for people that are still holding on to like a lot of, of memory, a lot of trauma, a lot of past experiences that have, you know, eventually now become, uh, you know, stories uh, within people's minds that are very limited, limiting um, in terms of the way that they think of themselves because of these experiences. That's a great question. I'll start with creating a frame for this. Uh, I think Aristotle gets credit for the quote, the art and literature of today is the future of tomorrow. I was not always a very big fan of fiction growing up. I was far more obsessed with nonfiction because I felt like it was easier to find truth in nonfiction than fiction. Uh, I've since moved away from, I, I do to be fair, 80% of what I read is still nonfiction, but I began to enjoy fiction a lot more because very often we are able to be introduced, introduced to deeper truths or understandings in fiction because it's more palatable to us. If you even see it, you'll see it in songs, right? If you remember five, six, seven years ago, whenever it was, um, when Frozen came out, there was a song, Let It Go. And it's a, it's a beautiful song if you, have, if you haven't heard it, but it was like, it made me laugh when it came out because it was like, it was being played in the elevator, it was being played in the grocery store, it was everywhere. And it was, the collective was creating a message to allow human consciousness to acknowledge and process something in a way that was very Trojan horse. It wasn't being presented as a, a nonfiction truth. It was being presented in fiction, but with a deeper truth. And if you're like, okay, where are you going with this? I just asked you a different question. I'm trying to create a frame here. <coughs> Star Wars, probably my favorite, uh, one of my favorite um, kind of story arcs, stories. I watched it since I was a little kid. And from the very beginning, the story was the, that they were supposed to bring balance to the force. And I never really understood that. Stay with me. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. I never really understood that because it, early life, I assumed that meant for those who haven't watched star Wars, I apologize, but in early life, I assumed that meant that the Jedi would defeat the Sith and that would bring balance. When in fact, the truth that was being spoke in fiction, there was 
When you are fully integrated, there is neither Sith nor Jedi. It's true balance. It's homeostasis, right? A karmic process, right? Karma is a very real thing. That karmic process is simply seeking balance. It's bringing back into your reality a homeostasis with your decisions and energetic uh, alignment. What the fuck does all that have to do with your question? The darkness, the shadow, the pain, the shame. You don't get away from it by not acknowledging it and bury it. You heal it and integrate it. You invite it back into yourself. That is true healing and integration where you no longer see this as black and white. You no longer see it as right and wrong. You see it as a whole, as one thing integrated and back inside of you. And you can back test what I'm saying. If it's like, well, what is the significance of that? How often do people put these things outside of themselves that they don't want anyone to see and they want to pretend that these things didn't happen or they don't hold these grudges or these grievances and it wrecks them their entire life. And as you get older, you can literally see in the physical body, the expression of these unresolved wounds and traumas where they're not doing the work of reintegrating. So this, in my estimation, is one of the most important steps of really becoming free is integrating the whole. So then the questions I ask is, well, how is it serving you by being angry about this? How is it serving you by not forgiving? How is it serving you by living in this shame? Right? And so you just, you bring space to this to allow the other to sit in awareness and ask themselves, well, why am I holding on to this? What is this doing for me? And most people in time will begin to realize it isn't serving me. Okay, great. Why are we doing it? What would happen if you forgave yourself? What would happen if you forgave the other? What would happen if you let go of this grievance or you let go of the story? What would be the consequence? What's the, what's the consequence of not doing this? Do you want to continue to experience this? So in the, in the religious community, specifically, I guess, Christianity, there's a lot of, of heaviness around this idea of hell and hell is this place in the future that happens if you don't live a good life, which and for many reasons, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I think is hilarious, but hell is now how is hell is separation from God now. And it's a choice. Mm. It's a choice to live in separation, right? And, and separate from ourselves by separating out these parts of ourselves that we don't want to accept. When in fact, you can only change these things about yourself when you then first choose to accept these things about yourself, right? It's like, there's, it's, a, it's a fascinating combo. It's like, what, what makes it hard to accept these things? What is your story about these things that makes it unacceptable to you? Right. What makes it hard to accept these things? And it's a, it's a fascinating thing. And more often than not, it's because we have projected stories of ideal within ourselves and our stories about the other. And we have cultural norms. We have family norms. It's all stuff that's coming at us. That's telling us we're supposed to be this way, this ideal self. And I call this the identity gap. And in my book, I talk about this, the difference between who you really are, the real you and the ideal you. And if the real you and the ideal you is too far apart, to the degree in which there is a gap, you lack power. And, and people who do this work, and Luke, I can tell just from talking to you, this is the journey you're on. This is the work you're doing. The closer the ideal you and the real you are, the more integrated you are, the more power you have and the power to mm. create in your world. Your words have weight and people can feel the weight because you do not speak as a man who's speaking from theory, but experientially integrated truth. Head and heart are mm. connected. And so many of us, our head and heart are not connected, right? We're, we're, way li we're living in our head and our heart is buried. It's only when we can integrate those truths where head and heart now speak together as one, that there is weight and power in our words. That's closing that identity gap. And that's integrating the ideal with the real and getting honest about who we actually are and accepting it. And that's, that probably means not taking yourself so seriously, right? Don't take anything too seriously. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, man. That was, that was a lot, but very powerful, detailed. Um, and, you know, I know that it's a lot of people out there as I've, you know, been on this journey, I've, I've had a lot of people say things like, it's easy for you to say. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard that, right? It's easier said than done, you yeah. know? Um, and I get pretty fired up and passionate about when I hear that kind of stuff because, because I'm like, yeah, but I've done the work. That's why it's easier for me to say. 
Yes. Right. Um, you yeah. Know, and 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 I always like reverb that back to people i'm like you know you, you, you're wasting time like so many of us think we have a long time you know uh we have plenty of time like you know it's okay i'll just keep going like this right and and it's always the case you get down the road a bit further another year another three years four years five years and like so many people have gone down this path of like you know i i knew that something was off 10 years ago and i didn't take any action because i was afraid yeah you know um so I think we have a very powerful um, purpose in terms of using our platforms to uh, to spread that energy uh, in such a positive way to like help people become aware and also for them to because I emphasize time all the time, man. <laughs> it's it doesn't care about no one. It just keeps going, you know. Yep. Um, even though it's just a made up construct, you know what I mean. Um, but we waste use. a lot of it. We waste uh, so much of it. And then, you know, and it's just like the worst thing that you can do is really get to the end. You know, Les Brown has a, has a, um, a story that he talks about, you know, you're in your bed, you're in your bed, deathbed, and there's yeah. the angels of, there's the dreams standing it's, around it's, your deathbed. And they're like, we came to you, you know, yeah. and, and now we have to die with you. Right. Um, so, you know, sharing messages the, the way you're sharing it and, you know, using these platforms is powerful. Um, so thank you for showing up, you know, um, because what you're doing is, is amazing. But um, I also want to, I also want to um, congratulate you, man. When I went, when we first, just before we got on, I checked your Instagram uh, and it was 499,000. And I checked it just before we started and it ticked over to 500,000. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, big, uh, big high five or high 10 celebration um, for you, man. <laughs> Congratulations, because... Uh, I know it's, I don't get too stuck within the numbers, to be honest with you. I mean, I, 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 I'm always like very active on social and I'm composting and I'm consistent and all that kind of shit. But, you know, it's still a big deal, you know, um, to, to have so much of an impact on so many people, you know. Um, so since we're talking about social media a little bit, I think that it's very important as an entrepreneur, as a speaker, as someone who's putting themselves out there all the time, um, it's important for for people to also, you know, because there's there's people out there that probably haven't even started their journey and they maybe they want to. And it's like, man, social media is a big place. You yeah. know, it, it's marketing, you know, it's putting yourself out there and people have a lot of fear. So um, what are some tips or, or some, uh, you know, things that you've learned um, on this journey of like from where you came from to kind of where you're at right now? Well, I, I appreciate the love and uh, I love the question. I, I, I've been asked to speak on social media growth a handful of times and I always kind of humbly say, yeah, you're, you're talking to the wrong guy. I, mm. I have a great team around me that does a great job of, of editing and posting and getting the content out there, but I don't think in those terms. I don't, I'm not, my goal is impact and influence to be sure. And I'm, I'm working on becoming more of a, getting becoming having a more professional understanding of the platforms and how they work and how to best maximize on them. But for somebody who's starting out, I would say don't start to cater to people. Don't create content that you think people are going to like speak your truth, be authentic to who you are. If you have a message in your heart that you think needs to get out there, get, get out there and just start doing it. Uh, I think part of the the key to to building a brand or to, to building longevity on any platform is just committing to the journey and committing to constantly uh, producing content. But I, I'm surprised how much as I'm getting into this space, how many content creators are reading off screens. They're looking at uh, teleprompters. They're they're building content exclusively for views. They're trying to get people to to look at it. Mm -hmm. My goal is if if is to drop is truth to the degree in which I can speak it. And I, I reserve the right to acknowledge I could say something today that six months from now, in light of new information and a new understanding or remembering, I may choose to, or I may change my opinion on something or change how I see something. But my commitment is to speak truth to the degree in which I see it and understand it for the betterment of humanity. And if it helps one person, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, and so, I would say to anybody who feels compelled that they have a message for the world to just start putting content out there. You'll learn as you go, but be authentic to who you are and be honest about who you are. And then 
also take the feedback, the good and the bad, right? When people will tell you what, how they're experiencing. And I, to my, my belief, and this goes back to personal responsibility is as the communicator, we have a responsibility to communicate. And so if we're trying to, to deliver a message and it's not hitting right, or we're being misunderstood, at least take the time to step back and go, well, is there a better way to say this? Could I have approached this differently? Is there a different way to frame this so that I could reach more people with this message? And so that's something I'm constantly doing is constantly evaluating. How can I say this message clearer or better or more effective? Because as a communicator, it is my responsibility to communicate effectively. And if I'm not to the majority of people, I don't cater to the minority of people. I can, I, I try to I look at the majority of people. If the majority of people are understanding what I'm saying, great. If they're not, then it's like, well, what, how could I have said this differently? How could I have said this better? But I would say, I guess, just to wrap that up, start, be authentic to who you are. Don't try to cater to people, but be true to who you are and your tribe will find you. Yeah, absolutely true. Powerful. Thanks for sharing, man. You're, you, you say you're an entrepreneur and you're, you know, you've got, um, is it, uh, is it Phoenix, Phoenix consulting group? It is. Um, yeah. What do you, what do you, what, what do you have available for people? What do you actually do? Like, do you have more than one business? Um, give us a, an, an insight into that, that, that side of, uh, of life. Well, Phoenix is a, is a consulting firm and more in the, in the traditional sense. So we do uh, a lot of work with companies around uh, marketing and sales, brand development, cultural transitions, leadership, executive coaching, things like that. Um, this year, we launched Quantum Academy, which was designed to be a public facing entity that I could connect with uh, community people that are like minded and what that really resonate with my message and would like to get more hands on coaching for me or more interaction or access to me. And then Reluctantly, but I've started doing it and enjoyed it uh, a lot more than I thought I was going to. I've started opening up a lot more of my coaching to the public. Uh, most of this, most of my coaching to this point has been in tactical one-to-one, face-to-face, um, and with my clients. And so I've really, really enjoyed that. And my goal right now is to build community, uh, to bring like-minded people together uh, for good. Right, I'm into tech for good. We started our, our fund this year. We're getting into more angel investing, and I'm looking for companies that are putting people and profit together. Right, it's no longer like I would describe it as conscious capitalism. I found out later that's actually a an entity, I guess, and, and a thought process. But conscious capitalism, which is simply until our consciousness is rise to a certain level, capitalism, I think, is still our best economic system. Which isn't to say that it's perfect or it doesn't have its flaws. Uh, but when you look at solving for humanity, capitalism solves for human nature, as I would say, better than any of the other systems that we propose so far. Now, at another level of consciousness, we may have a better economic system, and I'm really hoping we get there. We're not there yet. And so conscious capitalism would be this frame of putting people and profit together. When we look at, or maybe reframing how we look at profit, profit isn't just about money, but it's the ecological impact of the business on the environment. It's the the impact on the community, how many, how many uh, people do they employ it gainfully, right? Like looking at the whole ecosystem, not just the one problem they're trying to solve for, which is usually profit and a lot of capitalism these days, which has a lot of inherent flaws in it, I think. And so uh, I'm looking to invest in companies that are putting people and profit together and tech for good and things that are wanting to make solve really big problems and in a big way. And again, that goes back to Instead of pointing the finger out and saying, hey, this needs to get fixed, be the change you want to see in the world. If you're unhappy with how capitalism is in America or around the world, if you're unhappy with billionaires and what they're doing with their money, go become a billionaire and do something different. Show us all how it could be done differently. If you don't like the way companies are run today, if you don't like the cultures they're creating, create the companies that you want to work for. Right? Be the solution you want in the world. The worst thing you could do is sit in your dark room, depressed and sad, and point out at the world through social media and bitch and complain to everyone about how bad it is. Go do something about it. Absolutely, man. It's uh, something that I look forward to, um, you know, one day having like my own, uh, you know, restaurant or bar or whatever, because one of the things that I've seen changing so much is the because of technology and everyone wants to be efficient and everyone wants to save money right on 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 staff and all that kind of stuff and so when you go to a restaurant and my listeners would 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 have heard me <laughs> say this before you go to a, like even in some restaurants here in Dubai that do it 
you get to the to the table and they tell you to scan the barcode to mm -hmm. see the menu. Yeah. You know, and that is just something that I absolutely despise. Like I just dislike it so much um, because it takes away the whole point of going to a restaurant and being like I love to 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 be treated and to to be uh, acknowledged, you know, and to to be spoken to and to be informed. You know, this is what we have, and like to to be um, you know that that connection by somebody who is working there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and taking that away has just like, it's so impersonal. It's so disconnected. It's like, well, what's the point? Just fucking order takeaway. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I want to have my own, I want to have my own restaurant where, you know, I, because one thing I've been in customer service for 20 years. So for me, understanding, you know, what people, how, how to treat people, you know, um, and I want to be able to provide that hospitality for people where they come to a place and they are treated the way they should be treated. They absolutely love it. And, you know, it's obviously not just going to be that business, but, you know, that's something that I see that is creating a disconnection with people, yes. um, especially in the hospitality or, or restaurants. And it's just shit, man. Yeah. You know? Well, I agree. I think we are, I, you know, whether it sounds dystopian or not, it seems like it's likely going to be part of our process. Uh, the future will probably put way more of a premium on human interaction and experiences mm. that have human interaction because so much of it is going to yeah. become more automated again, for better or for yeah. worse. And, but I think the, I think the, the upside of that is we may come back to valuing human interaction in a different way and treat people better. Mm. Like customer service, uh, people who are in customer service, their servers that are people facing, and certainly we consult for a lot of them and work along with their own businesses. They put up with so much shit and they're not always treated very well. Um, and it's, you know, I, I applaud anyone who chooses yeah. to be public facing and to deal with people on a daily basis. And so I, I think we will eventually come back to really valuing human or interaction again and realizing that there's a real human being here mm -hmm. that's choosing to serve me Absolutely. in a restaurant or at a bar or wherever that, that is happening. So I'm with you, and I also would like to have a restaurant, not necessarily from a, uh, a profit standpoint, but more like a cheers where people can come. Well, that, everybody knows their name. Right, that's what I'm trying to. That's what I want. Like, because my my brother-in-law's, um, you know, I've been in a bit of hospitality restaurant. You know, my my family's, um, my sister's husband had a had a cafe, had a restaurant for many years, and I know that. Like, I saw how how challenging it was to maintain yeah. to. To, to, to run it, um, you know, it's not, it wasn't that easy to, for it to be profitable, right? Yep. So I already know that. And I'm like, for me, it's not about the money. I don't give a shit about the profit. I just want to have it, yep. you know, as, as a place go. of yeah. community and, yep. and you know, whatever, you know what I mean? And, and yeah, bro, so I'm we're on the same page. I love it. Yeah. It's good stuff. Well, when are you coming um, to the States next? But just before we finish. I'm um, most likely uh, second quarter of, of the of 2024. Well, if you get to the West Coast, I think when we talked originally, you were going to be in Laguna at some point. I don't know if that happened or not. You actually got out here, but if you ever get to the West Coast, let me know. I'd love to. I'd love to host you and get to connect with you and spend time with you out here in the U.S. Absolutely, man. We'll we'll stay in touch, and uh, you know, I'm sure there's uh, something big on the horizon. You know, there is. Um, but I'm, I'm all for, um, you know, and, and, you know, everything is about alignment. You know, I always tell people like surround yourself with that, which adds value to your life, but surround yourself with that, which makes sense. Is it in alignment? Does it, is it flowing? Yeah. Is there, is yeah. there an energetic match? You know what I mean? Um, a lot of people don't, don't get that, you know? Um, but, um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm feeling it and, and really looking forward to it. So thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate that, man. Awesome. Um, but, but um yeah just just finishing up man thank you so much for for your time for you know sharing everything that you have um it's it's an absolute blessing um you know to to have you on the podcast and um you know to to hear your stories and everything that you've done i'm sure there's obviously a lot more to learn and and i'm uh, i'm sure that no doubt um you know i invite everybody to uh to to um to go to your Instagram, to follow you and to connect with you on, on your platforms. Um, but I just, before I, I get you to share your platforms, um, where, where, where is Sebastian in 10 years time? Like what, what's going on? Mm. Uh, reluctantly 
Sebastian, 10 years from now, is probably getting more involved in politics than he wants to be, probably because he feels a personal responsibility to do so. Hopefully mm -hmm. legislating things in the spiritual realm so that I don't have to in the physical realm, but we'll see how the next 10 years mm -hmm. goes. Um, continuing to build community, to build businesses that hopefully are having a positive impact in the world and solving real world solutions and putting people and profit on the same page. Powerful. Absolutely amazing, man. Thank you so much. Um, where can people find you? Where's the best place to connect with you? Sebastian Ingus on all platforms. Uh, Sebastian is all A's, S-A-B-A-S-T-I-N, Ingus, E-N-G-E-S. Um, my Facebook page got hacked about six months ago, and we are furiously trying to get it back, but I think, we, I think we're turning a corner now. So Facebook may not be a good place to get me right now because I'm not in control of that page, but I, I think we got word yesterday. I think whoever was in control got booted and hopefully we'll have control of it here soon. But uh, I'm most active from a, a DM or kind of conversational place on Instagram uh, and TikTok. And so, but on all platforms, you can reach me there and, and my team uh, will we'll get back to you too. If, if anybody was, is looking to kind of go deeper with us, Quantum Academy is our platform for coaching and development. Um, I am speaking some, but I don't do a lot of public speaking. I'm pretty picky about it, but um, I do enjoy being able to connect with people all around the world. Do you are you doing your your own events? Yeah, we 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 have an event coming up in February uh, here in Orange County. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll do a handful of them a year. I'm going to start doing more immersion mastermind immersions in different locations around the country, which I'm very very excited about. Like small group really getting tactical with information. Again, I'm more, I'm more into teaching just in time versus just in case information and helping people integrate it quickly. So those truths get sticky and they work on the inside. So we're, we're trying to create environments that will help support that as well. Amazing. Amazing. Sebastian, thank you so much. Uh, one last piece of advice for anyone out there who is stuck. <laughs> They're stuck. Do what do they do? Uh, work. Do the work. It all comes down to personal responsibility and it all starts with awareness. Stay curious. Ask lots of questions. Uh, if there are any area of your life where you use the expression, well, that's what I've always believed or that's what I was taught or that's how we do it in my family or that's how we do it in my country or that's what we believe in my church or, or in our whatever. Right? Take the time to step back and go, but why? Don't believe it at face value. And I'm not saying because it was taught somewhere that it isn't right or isn't accurate. Doing the work is being to, is understanding and taking those truths and integrating yourself, not just believing them because somebody else said it. But do the work. Own yourself. Absolutely amazing. Sebastian, thank you so much for your time, man. It's been amazing to have you on the podcast. Um, I know that everybody who's listening, tuning in, uh, has gotten so much value and power from, from this uh, episode. And um, once again, thank you for the invitation as well. I'm definitely going to stay in touch and, uh, and uh, we'll do some big stuff, man. Absolutely. Awesome. Look forward to it, my friend. Appreciate you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining me on this journey of self-discovery and growth. If you're ready to grow and reach your full potential and find inner peace, send me a DM that says, I want inner peace and I'll send you the next steps. You can accomplish anything you set your mind to. When you change your mind, you change your whole life. So don't hesitate and send that DM over to me. Myself and my team can't wait to meet you and witness your transformation in full glory. See you next week.